Welcome to Spirited Seas, Science and Spirituality, an interfaith exploration of the environmental consequences of deep seabed mining. This webinar is organized by the G20 Interfaith Forum Working Group on Religion and Environment. We shall explore recent proposals for extraction of mineral resources such as polymetallic nodules from the deep seabed from the perspective of religion and spirituality and what such developments mean for Pacific Island peoples for whom the ocean is not just their surrounding environment, but from an indigenous worldview, an integral part of their very being. I am Dr. Arthur Dahl, president of the International Environment Forum, a Baha'i inspired professional organization for environment and sustainability. I lived in the Pacific Islands for 11 years as regional ecological advisor to all the island countries and organized SPREP, the Secretariat of the Pacific Regional Environment Program. As a marine biologist, I've studied the Pacific Islands environment for more than half a century. I feel very close to the Pacific Islanders and share their concerns as expressed in this webinar. As chair of the Working Group on Religion and Environment, I shall be your moderator. I want to acknowledge the efforts of Working Group member Arnie Sakai, who conceived and organized this webinar. Thank you, Arnie. We shall start with a short video excerpt from Blue Peril, prepared by the Deep Sea Mining Campaign, about the impacts of deep seabed mining. This is a visual investigation based on the best available scientific data incorporated internationally accredited oceanographic and spatial imagery programs. The video segment shows the oceanographic modeling of the spread of the wastewater expected to be discharged by just one of the many deep sea mining companies that could operate in the Pacific Ocean, the metals company in its Tongan licensed area. This will be followed by a 15 minute presentation by Dr. Helen Rosenbaum on the science of deep seabed mining. Helen is co-founder of the Deep Sea Mining Campaign. She holds a doctorate in medical science, has worked as a marine toxicologist and in the development of coastal management policy. She also has 30 years experience in environmental and human rights advocacy and in community development. Over the past 12 years, the Deep Sea Mining Campaign has worked in solidarity with civil society organizations, scientists and citizens around the world who are concerned about the likely impacts of deep sea mining on ecosystems and island and coastal communities. The next speaker, Dr. James Bagwine, is unfortunately in an airplane and has sent us his 10 minute contribution by video. Reverend Gagwan is General Secretary of the Pacific Conference of Churches, which is comprised of 33 churches and 10 national councils of churches across 19 Pacific Island states and territories. He is an ordained minister of the Methodist Church in Fiji, a former award-winning producer and radio TV host. He holds a Bachelor of Divinity with honors from Pacific Theological College in Suva, Fiji, and a Master's in Theology in Christian Social Ethics from the Methodist Theological University in Seoul, South Korea. He's involved in social justice issues and ocean health. We hope this will be followed by Rosa Koyan, a Papua New Guinea journalist. For many years now, she's been advocating for social and environmental justice. Papua New Guinea experienced a previous deep seabed mining project that was a total failure. Finally, Dr. Husra Ahmad, OBE, a member of our IEF 20 Religion and Environment Working Group, is the CEO of Global One 2015, which is a faith-based international NGO focused on women. She has a PhD in International Environmental Law from the School of Environmental and African Studies, London University, and is an honorary fellow of the Edward Cadbury Center for the Public Understanding of Religion at Birmingham University. She is currently a board member of Faith for the Climate and a member of the Women's Faith Forum UK. Just before we open for questions, we shall hear a concluding statement by Alana Smith from the Cook Islands, also taken from the excellent video, Blue Peril, which you can see in full 
on the DSM campaign organization website. Now we can go to the first video clip about what may happen to mining in the Pacific. Thank you. Here, we model the mid-water discharge plume in the Tonga contract area. Virtual sediment particles were released just below 1,000 meters and allowed to sink and spread horizontally with different ocean currents. Along the way, the plume may harm free-swimming species, including whales, turtles, dolphins, sharks, and tuna, for example, by clogging their gills. Extending our simulation runtime, we predict that it will only take three months for the discharge plume to reach Hawaiian waters, a unique marine ecosystem, a source of livelihood and home for its custodians. The plume's potential toxic impacts are a critical unknown. Our visualizations vividly demonstrate for the first time the vast area of the Pacific expected to be impacted by deep sea mining. How will the many plumes from the rush to mine the ocean floor affect Pacific communities and all of us? Thank you. Helen, do you want to make your presentation now? We look forward to your science. Thank you. Thank you and good morning, good evening, good afternoon everybody. It's morning for me here in, in Australia and um, I'll now, um, and it's a, it's a privilege to be able to be able to present to you all. Um, I'll now share my, my screen for my PowerPoint presentation. So as Arthur um, introduced, um, I'm presenting a, a science perspective. I am of the Jewish faith, as um, people may guess from my name, but um, uh, today I'm, I'm actually providing an overview on, on the science. I co-founded the Deep Sea Mining Campaign with uh, Catherine Cummins, uh, our colleague from Mining Watch Canada, 12 years ago, in response to um, concerns by communities in Papua New Guinea about the Sol Wara One mine. Um, so that mine, as uh, Arthur referred to, um, was was a failure in that the initial mining company. Um, uh, Nautilus Minerals did go bankrupt, but unfortunately, those li licenses that the PNG government uh, allocated to Nautilus have uh, been taken up by another company. And so the spectre of deep sea mining in the Bismarck Sea of Papua New Guinea is, um, is not over, unfortunately. So over the past 12 years, our core work program has focused on science-based advocacy, finance advocacy, and solidarity and collaboration with people in the Pacific, uh, initially in Papua New Guinea, as I mentioned, and, uh, and I hope Rosa will be able to make it on today. Rosa and I have worked together quite often in the past, and also international networks. Um, We've produced many comprehensive um, science-based reports, uh, fact sheets, and um, continue to use those as a way to inform our campaigning going forward, including in the lobbying of uh, banks and insurance companies, which is the basis of our finance advocacy work. Uh, which that segment we just watched came from is an attempt to try the other uh, scientific on, on deep sea mining more accessible to a broader audience. 
and I will pop in the chat later the um, the URL for for the video if people would like to watch the whole video. It's only fifteen minutes long. Um, despite that short length, it took us three years to produce it. Uh, three years of discussions with scientists of uh, revising oceanographic modelling and, um, and getting the spatial imagery right. It was a collaborative project um, with the Interpret Design Studio um, based at the Trondheim University in Oslo and also uh, the German NGO Ocean in Dialogue. And I'll be referring to some of the key findings from Lou Carroll um, as we go through this talk as well. So what do we mean by deep sea mining? Uh, 200, um, the depth at which light, sunlight doesn't penetrate any further, but deep sea mining occurs on the deep sea floor um, so typically, depending on the different type of substrate that uh, mining companies are looking at, um, the, the depth varies. So uh, seafloor massive sulphides, from, which are the deposits around these um, mini gate geysers, uh, undersea geysers called hydrothermal vents, um, the in Guinea, that's that was the focus of the, and is the focus of the Solwaral mining project. Um, that's at about 1.6 kilometers under the sea. Um, mining companies have also been interested in cobalt-rich crusts, which occur around sea mounts, uh, which are extinct volcanoes, um, underwater mountains. Um, polymetallic um, nodules are the um, the mineral deposit has attracted the most attention by mining companies. And typically they occur uh, in the Pacific Ocean and around, um, and I'll show maps of their, um, their distribution soon, um, so at around three to six kilometres depth. So at the moment, there is no commercial mining yet, um, which means that we still have a window of opportunity to stop this extractive enterprise before it starts. And that's quite unique. With just about every other form of resource extraction, uh, we're left with tweaking the regulations to try and minimise impact. So um, it's a rapidly closing window, but um, there's, there's hope yet. Um, at the moment, um, exploration is occurring within the national territorial waters of, um, of countries, uh, so such as um, Papua New Guinea, uh, the Cook Islands at the moment in the Pacific. And so the regulation and the governance and the, the licensing processes are uh, under the jurisdiction of uh, national governments in those cases. Uh, the vast area of the Pacific Ocean is uh, in international waters, which is also called the high seas or the area. Uh, and that those international waters come under the jurisdiction of an organisation called the International Seabed Authority which is prized seven uh, governments, na national governments, and uh, plus the EU. So this map just shows a worldwide distribution of different um, deposits of the three types of um, mineral substrates. Pacific Ocean, the Clarion Clipperton zone, which um, we could we could say is experiencing an exploration frenzy. So this area spans about five thousand kilometres from Hawaii and Kiribati to Mexico, and as you can see, there's a band of it's about one thousand 
kilometres, uh, which work of licences that have been allocated by the Inland Seabed Authority to government and corporate entities. So unbeknownst to most of the world's population, Islanders, I think it's fair to say, the world's largest um, mining project could be starting in the, the very back of Big Island. This um, the company, polymetallic nodules, flying, as I said before, about three to six kilometres. These very things known as these little planes. Um, there's very little change. It's, it's thought that the, um, you know, it's a still quiet and dark place. There's extreme temperatures and pressures. And uh, that, that, those are also extreme life forms that are adapted to them. But not very much is known about those life forms or, in fact, the polymetallic nodules themselves. Um, it's thought that these nodules take millions of years. To, it's not clear why and how exactly they form. And, but we, what we do know is that at this depth and on this very soft mud at the bottom of the ocean, they the honey hubs that life forms can attach to. Um, they provide feeding grounds, breeding grounds, and... Um, and the removal of these nodules would mean that um, this whole ecosystem would be removed for millions of years as well. The, the life forms down there are barely known to science. It's estimated that only a few percent of the seabed around the world, and including in this area of the CCZ, the clarion Clickinson zone, has been surveyed by, um, ecologically. But... Of that small fraction that has been surveyed, there are thousands of organisms still we formally identified by science. So the extinction that deep sea mining would cause of these organisms that they go before we even know what they are and who they are. Just to, by way of illustration, um, to, to show how little we know about uh, the nodules and the risks that mining them would uh, create. Only two weeks ago, research was published by a laboratory in uh, Germany, showing that there, the outer layer of the polymetallic nodules is actually highly radioactive. Um, exceeding uh, limits for human exposure by up to thousand times. Um, so this paper focuses on the health aspects for people who might be exposed to radiation from polynodules during the processing of the nodules. It doesn't uh, address what happens when the wastewater and the um, sediment disturbance um, created by deep sea mining occurs in the main marine environment. However, it does state that um, these radioactive, alpha-emitting radioactive particles would be released into the marine environment where they would be ingested and come into close contact with marine organisms and ultimately work their way up the food system, uh, the food chain and be um, ingested by us human consumers. Um, these type of uh, radioisotopes, the alpha emitters, are known to be able to be bioaccumulated and once they're ingested or inhaled, 
they're considered to be extremely toxic. So that's a rather dramatic finding. And um, given the, um, the high level of interest in deep sea mining and um, the research that's been going on, it's um, kind of disturbing that we have only just found out about this uh, two weeks ago. So this, this just shows we think deep sea mining would occur. Um, this is the, the proposition put forward by companies as to how they, they would do, do deep sea mining. It also kind of illustrates all the different um, points at which impact could occur. So as you can talk, um, these vessels would um, support the operation in different ways and also um, be the, uh, receive the nodules that are dredged up by these huge machines um, at the, at the seafloor. So in order to do that, the um, polymetallic nodules are fucked up in a, in a slurry. Um, perhaps three to six kilometres, what is kind of a, a relatively flimsy pipe, um, up to the surface um, to, the, to the vessel up there. Um, while these um, machines are um, um, scraping and dredging the seafloor, they're churning up vast amounts of sediment and I'll um, describe the impact of those um, effectively seabed dust storms um, in a moment. Um, you can see there are other best, um, monitoring kind of um, submersibles there. Um, and all of this, um, and there's, there's also other forms of pollution. So the video that we saw at the start um, referred to what we call the mid water so once the nodules are dredged up to the, the surface on the ship, there's some preliminary processing and then wastewater will be discharged at about 1,000 um, sorry, 1,000 metres below the surface. So at about a kilometre below the surface, the wastewater will be discharged. Um, we now know that wastewater will be radioactive as well as potentially carrying heavy metals. Um, and the other important point there is to this very quiet, still deep sea environment, it's going to be a huge introduction um, of noise and light. Um, on the bottom of the seafloor, there is no light other than adaptation to sea organisms. Um, to create their own light in order to see each other, to hunt, to mate, etc. So there's going to be huge disturbances um, to the whole deep sea environment. Um, this quote is, um, is refers to an observation made um, from an experiment where um, Searches. So in a, a small sled carried by a tractor and came back um, 30 years later and saw that the tracks were still, were still as deep and are still as um, in the same condition as they left them. So that indicates that how long Lasting the impacts of deep sea new miles and later, and still see those tracks, um, and nature has not been able to rehabilitate them. Now, if we consider that um, full scale uh, commercial sea mining will involve um, much larger mining machines than this, um, this prototype. Um, which is a Belgian government um, a GSR company um, prototype. Um, the impact, you can start getting a feel for the impacts 
The full-scale mining machines are probably going to be about two storeys high um, and um, with enormous weight. And they're probably going to be working in tandem several at a time um, from the one um, mothership and uh, over a 30-year plus license period. So if there's many um, uh, mine, deep sea mining operations occurring in the Pacific Ocean floor, um, there's 17 licenses issued um, at the moment, the impacts of this uh, occurring around the clock 24-7, you know, are just horrendous. As, As, you know, I mentioned before, this would be the world's largest mining operation, strip mining operation. So our Blue Peril um, investigation predicts that the metals company alone would destroy an area seabed similar to the land area whole of Hawaii in that 30-year licence period. So, you know, multiply that out for, for the many, many um, licences that are likely to occur. Um, Blue Peril focuses largely on the metals company because the metals company is has been the um, most aggressively pursuing deep sea mining in the Clarion Clipperton zone through its sponsor Nauru. It has triggered um, a a rule at the International Seabed Authority. Uh, whereby they will be able to submit for consideration a, a license, uh, an application for a license to start mining, whether or not environmental regulations and other regulations for seabed mining have been finalised. Um, at the moment, those regulations are still under discussion. They've been a long time in discussion because there's many complex issues. And with this new information about the radioactivity, um, there's a whole lot more for the International Seabed Authority to consider about the risks of deep sea mining. Thank you, Helen. Could you try to wrap up? Okay. So as I, um, as I re referred to before, um, there will be the seabed dust storms occurring. Um, the, the sediment um, alone, without heavy metals and radioactivity, the sediment alone will have an impact. Clogging uh, the gills of fish, smothering animals, interfering. Um, and the modelling presented in Blue Peril as uh, predicts that the sediment cloud generated by the metals company in its Nauru license area in 30 days. Over a 30 year license, that could spread thousands of kilometres for the fine particles. In fact, some scientists have suggested it could, those, those fine particles, once disturbed, could travel around the world. Um, the mining companies like to say that, that they, they have much less impact than base mines um, and they don't produce tailing waste. Uh, that's a total fallacy. Um, as I mentioned before, the uh, wastewater would be discharged at about one kilometres after the initial processing of nodules. And as we know um, now, um, um, there is the potential to spread heavy metals and radiation into marine and, um, and human food chains. Thank you, and, uh, uh, As we saw in the video clip, I will, <laughs> I've just got one more slide. <laughs> the modelling presented in Blue Peril predicts it would only take three months for the pollution discharged by the metals company to reach Hawaiian and Kiribati waters. So what does, so in order to wrap up, uh, what does the science tell us? 
Um, the scientific consensus is that the impacts of DC mining be severe and last for generations. So in human time scales, the impact would be essentially um, and the uh, extinctions would be essentially irreversible. It's not really possible to think about the mines because of the, the technical difficulties and the social and economic gains are not substantiated. Um, in fact, um, Pacific Island countries sponsoring deep sea mining could find themselves um, being a uh, hit for significant environmental damage um, and those liabilities would be based on risk to the income of other companies countries potentially and enterprises for fisheries and tourism. The mining companies also like to use as an argument that seabed mining will be essential to transition to um, reduce carbon emissions, but the research does not bear that out and suggests that it will be possible to tran transition to 100% renewable energy by 2050 um, by re better recycling. Um, we use, we're very poor recyclers globally of our electronics and batteries currently. Developing um, circular economy method, methods of manufacturing and with new battery technologies coming online, the minerals that would be produced by polymetallic nodules will not be very um, necessary. Um, the, what we're looking at are lithium batteries rather than um, cobalt, um, manganese, copper that would be um, uh, produced by deep sea mining up. And we already have so many existing land-based mines. Let's clean up their act. So thank you very much. Thank you, Alan, for a very complete review of the dangers of deep sea mining and the, the, the dangers of rushing ahead with this as it's being proposed at the present time. Now we can go to the presentation by the Reverend James Bagwan, which has been recorded for us. Thank you. Warm Pacific greetings. I acknowledge the ancestors of our island communities and of all the communities to which you belong. I acknowledge the indigenous communities of the lands on which you are today, custodians, and guardians of land, sea, and sky, past, present, and arising. My gratitude to the organizers of this online gathering, this Fei Talanoa, Tok Tok, Tok Story, Yani, Hui, or panel discussion. In 2021, on my way to attend the Climate Change Conference COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland, I traveled through London to join the Pacific Climate Warriors on the steps of the Royal Exchange located opposite the Bank of England in London for a climate action. The Royal Exchange was first built and established in the 16th century to act as a center of commerce for the city of London. It was Britain's first specialist commercial building. Arriving early, I spent some time looking at the front, the facade, the entrance of the current Royal Exchange building, which was rebuilt some 180 years ago. At the top of the building is a triangular structure known as a tympanium. In ancient Greek, Roman, and Christian architecture, the tympanium uh, of a religious building often contained a sculpture or mosaics with religious imagery. But it wasn't the imagery that caught my attention. It was an inscription which reads, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That sounds familiar, I thought to myself. It was indeed familiar. It was a verse from the book of Psalms, the very first verse from the book of uh, Psalm 24. So let me read uh, a few verses. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it the world and all who live in it, 
for he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessings from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. This passage resonated with me because of two things. Firstly, the verse that says, the verses that say, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for they founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. It was a reminder that we are, as Pacific people, custodians of the land and the sea, because creation, including humanity, belongs to God. So from a specific perspective, we are part of the land and the sea and the sky, from a mountain ridge to reef and to seabed, all a part of God's precious creation. And so I, I begin this way because our Christian spirituality recognizes the integral indigenous relationship with land, with sea and sky, as part of the original relationship given to us by God and creation. Spirituality is integral to the way we interpret, understand, and interact with one another and with the natural world. It shapes our indigenous knowledge into wisdom and guides us to act with gentleness and gratitude for the abundance that surrounds us. Our indigenous spirituality and knowledge, the wisdom of the ancients, who read the stars and traveled across our mighty ocean in their giant double-hulled canoes millennia before European discovery and conquest, considered themselves part of the ecosystem and not apart from it, not above it. The ocean is central to our existence, our Pacific culture, spirituality, identity flow with the ocean's tides, connecting our relationships, regulating our very existence through long-term ocean health. The rhetoric of today's dominant blue economy distorts this relationship. It marginalizes Pacific people's voices, allowing for the exploitation and extraction of sea and human life, or economic wealth for very few at the expense of so many. And this leads me to that second point or that second reflection from the following verses, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place, this one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust an idol or swear by a false god. Now, from a Christian perspective, the idol and false god referred to in the psalm does not refer to another religious or faith community or practice. Even the reference by Jesus on serving God and serving mammon the Syrian deity of wealth and riches, was not a criticism of the Syrian faith, but a criticism of the deification of the accumulation of wealth. One's life becoming a quest to accumulate more and more wealth and property until it becomes a religious practice supplanting all other things. And wealth itself becomes an object of worship. Corporate capture of Christianity, and this has happened with other faiths as well, and the colonial capture of the Christian mission endeavor led to a capitalistic ideology of domination and exploitation of land and people, which is a strong part now of neoliberal capitalism today. The land and the people now exploited, attention is turned to the sea. And under the guise of the blue economy, we find industrialization agenda of extractive ocean economics, both old fisheries and aquaculture, tourism, shipping, and new frontier issues such as deep sea mining, genetic resource exploitation, renewable energy, etc. Under a guise of sustainability and a Pacific Ocean identity, blue prosperity. Activities such as deep sea mining that are focused on exploiting our ocean environment within a wider context of the climate emergency, human-induced impacts 
are not really an effective response to our specific needs. Such activities places risks on our sources of life, including ecology, identity, culture, livelihoods, food, security, well-being, and the health of the planet. And deep sea mining is the latest in a long list of destructive industries to be thrust into our sacred ocean. It is a new perilous frontier extractive industry being falsely promoted as a proven answer to our economic needs. And while its promised benefits remain speculative, its, its pursuit is insidious. Even at an experimental stage, deep sea mining is already proving harmful to Pacific communities, to their livelihoods, to their cultural practices and their well-being. And so there needs to be a total ban on deep sea mining within our territorial waters and in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Because our ocean is not compartmentalized. Our ocean is a whole. It is full of life. It is alive. Land-based mining also came with the promise of social and environmental benefits for our people. And Pacific peoples have carried the environmental and social costs of phosphate, copper, gold, bauxite mining in the and continue to feel the impacts of its devastation. Our lived experience in the Pacific shows clearly that the powerful corporations benefit the most while our people bear the costs the destruction of our natural environment. Across the resource frontiers of our region, history records this deception time and time again. The corporations, institutions, and their government backers advocating deep sea mining promise great wealth from the unexplored depths of our ocean. Their claim is that deep sea mining's environmental impacts will be minimal. And it is audacious to say so, given the fact that very little is known, let alone understood about the ecologies of our oceans. Let us be mindful that deep sea mining only serves those for whom the acquisition of wealth is the ultimate objective, not the well-being of people and planet. Well, we can thank Reverend Magwan for his beautiful presentation. And now we have an opportunity to hear from Rosa Koyan, a journalist in Papua New Guinea, where they've had already some experience with deep sea mining. Rosa, you have the floor for a little less than 10 minutes, if possible. Thank you. Rosa, need to unmute. Okay, sorry, good morning. I'm having tech issues here. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. Um, okay, so um, thank you, Reverend Bogwan. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm sorry, I'm just going to speak here. I was planning on sharing my, my screen. Um, but now my laptop is not working, so I'll just speak to what I have here. Um, so I'm speaking from Papua New Guinea in Port Mosby. Um, yes, I am a journalist, and um, but I've also worked in, in the community for many, many years um, on environmental um, issues. Um, so here, is, this is a very short presentation of the traditional world where I come from in Papua New Guinea. I will introduce Papua New Guinea and then spend some time on our way of life here. I will talk about peace and order our relationship with the sea, the fishing and the trading expeditions and the colony down under. In short, in Papua New Guinea, we coexist with our world. And this world 
is often confusing for an outsider. The second line in our PNG's national pledge reads, we pay homage to our cultural heritage, the source of our strength. So our constitution recognizes our traditional, our cultural heritage as the source of our strength. From the depths of our sea and great ocean, thank you for this opportunity to show to share our Papua New Guinea story. Peace was our order. So Papua New Guinea is a land of more than 860 nations and languages. At least 80% of our people still live off the land and the sea. This is a world where our ancestral spirits inform us of how we could coexist with our world around us. Whether we are from the sea or the land, our ancestral world teaches us of our territories, the rituals we must perform if we cross boundaries into other territories so that we do not disturb their peace on the other side. Peace was paramount in our traditional cultures. Hunters and fishermen and women, even children, ensure that they do not upset the spirits who guard the, the reefs, the water holes, the beaches. And so they observe the rules as prescribed to them. These are stories from a world that was, a world that is slowly passing by. In today's eyes, as we see the surface of the sea, it looks as if nothing is beyond its depths that it is only a flat sheet of water, or if it is agitated, it wakes up and then goes back to sleep. That is where our human mind often falls short and fails us. As my mother would tell me, look beyond your feet, listen beyond your ears, and you will learn. In Papua New Guinea, many local communities did not welcome seabed mining or any other mining activities that threaten or to destroy their sacred sites. Because those were places for sacred knowledge. Many didn't understand what to expect, but they understood their responsibility to caring for those that cannot speak. The fear was that once mining for mineral resources was happening in the backyard. However, today proposed, the proposed mining activity is happening or will be happening right in the belly of Papua New Guinea. The sea and human relations. Papua New Guinea has many stories to tell of our relationships with the sea. For instance, I live in Port Mosby, there's a village called Pari. It's an urban village on the edges of Port Mosby. There is a story that goes like this. Many years before Papua New Guinea's independence, in traditional times, no other motu or any Papuan would have approached the Oyster Bay. So there's this Oyster Bay in um, Pari village either by land or from the sea during the sacred tuna fishing season. So when the tuna comes out and people are fishing, nobody else should be crossing that, that path. The author, Palsford, went on to document a myth of a woman in that community who was pregnant and was having labor pains while in her garden. So she went to the nearby, nearby beach to give birth. When she saw her baby, she thought it had died. But then after a while, she saw that it was five fish struggling in the placenta. She gently put them in the sea. And every day after that, she would go to the beach and be with them. From another community um, in Medeng, women of Malmal village would talk about how they read the sea level on the reefs. 
and that indicated it was time to plant the EM seeds. The only certain times of the year the sea rises above a certain point on the reefs, and that is where they can put when they can put the EM seeds in the ground. This skill helped them to produce a very good yield at harvest time. In East New Britain, and still today, it is a tourist attraction. In East New Britain, in, there are two rocks called the Dawapia rocks. They stand today. Their story is that two brothers were greedy and didn't want to share their catch after their fishing trip. The ancestors dealt with them, turning them into rocks so that the fishing ground can be free for others to use. There are across Papua New Guinea various similar stories that while many today find it strange, it demonstrates people's relationships with their environments. And the bottom line, teaching of peace, sharing and shared spaces. This and many others teach us about life, survival and coexistence. Many thousands of years later, still people still observe these teachings from the environment. As, as I said, 80% still live off the land and the sea. Silence, prayer, and respect were key to knowledge acquisition and maintenance of peace. Now I will talk about the fishing and trading expeditions. The shark taming or calling and trading cultures know that about every, above everything, they must observe the laws of the sea as prescribed by their ancestors. The men must go out to sea for meat, for trade and foreign relations, and to demonstrate their mastery of their world. Before they can embark on such journeys, they have to go through sacred rituals before going out on a sea expeditions. They submit to the rules of their territories. The farther they go, they not only go for sharks, but to demonstrate their mastery of their domains. In the event they know they stepped out of line, the blood of a healthy pig must be spilled. This demonstrates admittance to the wrong and the submission to the rule of law in that particular domain. In New Island province, the houseboy, this is uh, the men's school, still exists today. The houseboy is a university where young men go to learn about an art, only their culture are masters of. Each apprentice is paired with a master, shark caller, and he goes through tr the trainings. An apprentice has to pass each level in order to qualify for the next and the ultimate goal to reach the master's level. In the trading cultures, as with the shark taming culture, the canoe is significant. It is built with a specially selected tree from the bush. With special rituals, it is carved and prepared for the journeys. Before it is hailed onto the sea, it goes through a ceremony again. The ceremony is the canoe is dressed and adorned with ornaments from the sea. And before sailing, the crew will have to go through rituals to protect them on the journey, to help them bring back a good catch. They understood the dangers of sailing in open sea, but they must learn the skills of reading the winds and the tides, and more importantly, how they behave while on their journey. As was practiced many thousands of years ago, women and children didn't go too far. Women fished on the shores and sometimes on the reefs. The children played in the sea while their mothers were fishing or making baskets and fishing nets on the seashore. So the sea was the playing ground for the children. It was the men who would go out to sea beyond the reefs on the, their canoes 
only selected women would travel to look after the trading items they were saying they were carrying. The fishing expeditions. Sorry. Upon their return, they had to share their catch. Sharing is a key element in all traditional cultures, as the spirits have generously helped them with the catch. It is the expectation that the catch will be shared with all in the village. On arrival at the beach, the first person to spot the fisherman, even if it's a toddler, the catch must be shared with him or her. All household within the village must have a share from that catch. And to the colony down under, in the sea floor, a colony of Nautilus and many other sea creatures exist. Many coastal communities do not see, for instance, the Nautilus. These Nautilus live until the shells wash up on the shores. And that is enough for, for the local communities to know that they are, there is another being somewhere beneath. People are comfortable with the world beneath and they respect their boundaries. The reefs are their fishing grounds. Fish and selfish and other edible sources of food are harvested with due care to leave the rest for later. From the depths of their Nautilus homes, little do they know their name, their style and glamour have been taken. The chambered Nautilus has informed some of our great structural architects for instance, do they know their homes are being targeted for mineral resources? Maybe not, but they continue to live in the sea floor and mingle and brighten that sea floor with the community of other sea creatures. And they ask not anything from the human world. And so, in conclusion, I, in conclusion, I want to say that this is a world that go, coexists even today um, with our spirited world. Let us be silent for a while because it is in silence that we hear others. The rules are simple. We respect each other because we coexist, whether they are, they are sea creatures, they are land creatures, we humans are creatures also. Our sacred rituals remind us of the rules and of our existence. In coexistence, we understand our powers, but we submit to the rules as, we, as prescribed by our ancestral spirits. Sharing is a virtue and when we fail, our ancestral spirits will punish us. And so as humans, we are here and we have a responsibility over everything around us. And it is our duty to care. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa, for sharing your very deep wisdom that we certainly need in our Western world and to address these issues. That was very, very valuable. Now our last speaker is Dr. Husna Ahmad. Uh, we're very happy to have her share her wisdom to wrap up this webinar. Over to you. Thank you so much, Arthur. And um, Rosa, that was beautiful. Honestly, it was very, very moving. Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you all. I'd like to focus my intervention of this topic of deep sea mining on three aspects. Number one, Islam's perspective on water conservation. Can you all hear me, Arthur? Um, number two, what I believe the Islamic perspective on deep sea mining to be. And number three, this moment that we have today to make a change. Traditionally, Muslims have a very close and spiritual kind of relationship with water. The word for water, ma, appears more than 60 times throughout the Quran, as well as other words relating to water, such as rivers, sea, fountains, springs, rain, 
hail, clouds and wind. The theme of water in the Quran is explored both symbolically and at a practical level. In the creation of the heavens and the earth and the alternation of night and day and the ships that run in the sea with, with that which benefits mankind and the water that Allah sends down from the sky then gives life with it to the earth after its death and spreads in it to all kinds of animals and the changing of the winds and the clouds made subservient between heaven and earth there are surely signs for a people who understand Quran 21.107 Water is an integral part of Islam and has been embedded in Islamic beliefs and customs. The term Sharia, Islamic laws, could either mean the watering source or the path that leads to a source of water. Thus, it's a metaphor for divine law quenching the thirst of knowledge or a path leading to the source of truth. As a Muslim, it's important to acknowledge water is one of the immense mercies Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon us. This gift is the proof of the existence and uniqueness of Allah as stated in the surah of the ant. Or who has created the heavens and the earth and who, has, who sends you down water from the sky. Yea, with it we cause to grow well-planted orchards full of beauty of delight. It's not in your power to cause the growth of the trees in them. Can there be another God beside Allah? Surah Nam. 2760. In Surah Al-Furqan, Quran, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes his mercy. And it is he who sends the winds as good tidings before his mercy, and we send down from the sky pure water, Quran 2548. In addition, another surah states, and have you seen the water that you drink? Is it you who brought it down from the clouds, or is it we who bring it down? If we willed, we could make it bitter. So why are you not grateful? Quran 56, 58 to 70. Water is also a symbol of resurrection since paradise is always described as a place of rivers flowing and, uh, and florid vegetation. Surah Nal 16, 30 to 31. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, describes water as one of the three wonders of the natural world that every human is entitled to. Muslims have common share in three things, grass, water, and fire. Abu Dawood, book 23, 3470. Another aspect associated to water in the Quran is its purifying power. Several verses focus on the subject of purification and personal cleanliness. Now, the second aspect that I wanted to focus on is what I believe is this Islamic perspective on deep sea mining. Stewardship. Islam emphasizes the concept of stewardship, khilaf, khalifa, which means that humans are responsible and entrusted with the care of this beautiful earth and its resources. We as Allah's stewards on earth have the responsibility of preserving the natural order of earth and maintaining its balance and must strive to ensure the fair allocation of resources. This includes protecting the blue heart of the planet, the oceans and the resources they contain. Prohibition of waste. Islam also prohibits waste and extravagance as they are seen as contrary to the principles of moderation and conservation. This principle can be applied to the exploitation of natural resources, including the mining of the deep sea. Muslims are encouraged to use resources in a responsible and sustainable way. Dr. Al-Jayusi articulates it well when he says, Zud means living lightly on earth, which is an Islamic concept that promotes conservation and rational use of resources. Protection of biodiversity. Islam recognizes the value of biodiversity and the importance of preserving it. This includes protecting marine ecosystems and the species that inhabit them. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was probably the first to introduce the notion of protected areas, Hima. Hima in, is an Arabic word which means inviolate zone or boundary. So last year's COP16 CBD brought in the 30 by 30 notion, which will provide sanctuaries both on land and the earth and, and the sea. Fair distribution of resources. Islam also emphasizes the importance of the fair distribution of resources. It's that Muslims are urged to walk, work towards social justice and to address the needs of marginalized communities. And ethical considerations. 
Final Islam recognizes the importance of ethical considerations in all aspects of life, including the exploitation of natural resources. This includes considering the impact of, mineral, of mining on local communities, as well as on the environment. Muslims are urged to act with integrity and to consider the long-term consequences of their actions. The concept of ummah or community is very important for Muslims. Overall, there are many ways in which Islamic principles can be applied to the issues of environmental protection and conservation of natural resources in the context of UNCLOS and deep sea mining. We need to be taking a holistic approach that considers the ethical, social and environmental impacts of mining activities. Finally, the moment, this moment that we have today to make a change. I want to focus on this moment today. I am a British Muslim woman based in London, um, originally ethnically from Bangladesh, which is a low-lying low country. And I am astounded by the mixed messages that my government, the British government, is sending out about deep sea mining. On the one hand, you have the policy paper on the resilience for the future, the UK's critical mineral strategy, which was updated this March, from the Department of Business and Energy, and it is encouraging research on DSM, talking about exploration and explo exploitation. And on the other hand, the British government played a positive role in getting the Global Oceans Treaty through the UN. The new Global Ocean Treaty finally makes it possible to create a network of ocean sanctuaries across the globe, areas where fragile ecosystems and marine life can recover and thrive. This is a critical moment that we all need to embrace and deeply breathe in. This is so significant because if we can halt exploitation by July, 2023, then we have a chance. The evidence is clear. There is no evidence. There's no real evidence to make a decision you know, uh, of such high magnitude. If we looked at um, Dr. Rosenbaum's um, presentation, so many negative things are coming out. So why do I think this is such an important moment? Because we have a, had a similar moment when the Industrial Revolution began. All resistance was bulldozed and the colonialization of the global South is a sad stain on the global North, which can, they can never repay. Today, it's not the global North that are pushing for exploitation of the deep sea bed, or what is being described as critical minerals, but nations from both the North and South, including China and India, as well as the UK and European countries. How do we stop history repeating itself? My plea to the faith communities is to amplify our voices against deep sea mining. Just the exploration stage has shown so many negative ripples for the nations who are dependent on the oceans. Two billion people will be affected just by the exploration. Why can we all not take a moment to pause and think about the impact of our consumption and greed? If we are not going to greenwash this issue, as well as so many others, we need to reduce our consumption. We need to really push for a circular economy and learn from the wisdom of our faith traditions and indigenous traditions. I pray that our voices will be heard and we can bring a halt to deep sea mining, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you, Her Husband, for sharing that beautiful wisdom from all of our faith traditions. Give us the same message that we have to be care for the environment around us. And let's hope that this webinar will inspire all of us from our different faith traditions to make our, our voices heard and to say, let us avoid you know, these terrible things before they, they be, it becomes too late. It's, this is a very, a very challenging time. We unfortunately run a bit owner, low, over time. Uh, there was one question which uh, respect to documentation from Helen Rosenbaum and she said, if you want documentation, you can email her at helen.rosenbaum one at gmail.com. Uh, and I think we've already shared uh, publicly the link to the Blue Peril video, in this, which you may want to watch together and share with your faith communities. This is the kind of message we all need to hear. So we want to thank you all for joining us in this webinar. Uh, we hope that despite some small technical problems, you found it really rewarding. And uh, 
We hope that we can, you will join us with future webinars in the future. We want to also thank the, uh, the, the Interfaith Forum's Anti-Racism Initiative, which is a co-sponsor of this event and helped us with the technical side today. So thank you also you know, for that. It's been a wonderful sharing of, of wisdom that we need to get across to the materialistic world and try to slow things down in time. So thank you all for joining us. Have a good morning, afternoon, or evening, or sleep, whatever it is before you in this round world of ours. And thank you all for, for listening.